Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Drone 4 showing you General Motors' current home, the iconic Renaissance Center. But in the background, their future headquarters, now called Hudson's Detroit. Thanks for being here with us for the News at 6. I'm Kimberly Gill. And I'm Demond Fernandez in for Devin Skillian. In one simple move few saw coming, General Motors agrees to move out of the Rensen and to a brand new spot right around the corner. Yeah, this is big news. This all, of course, raises all sorts of questions about the future of the building, which has stood as the defining structure of Detroit's skyline since construction was completed back in 1976. Business editor Rod Maloney live to break down what came out of a joint news conference between GM and Bedrock. Rod. Well, Kimberly, you know, this was uh, as stunning as it was back in 1996. I was there when GM announced that they were going to buy the Rensen for $75 million. They've since put a billion dollars into it, but it's a tough building. It's always been difficult for them. And now this seems to make as much sense as buying the Rensen did back 28 years ago. So let's talk about that a little bit. General Motors now only has about 2,500 employees downtown after COVID, much of the operation moved to the tech center up in Warren. And apparently Dan Gilbert has long had this idea as he built his massive tower here downtown of moving GM into the office tower, which sits in front here. Today, I could not be more pleased to welcome General Motors to Hudson's Detroit. Dan Gilbert made his stamp even more delible on Detroit's landscape, GM foregoing its longtime headquarters on the river and moving into the newly named Hudson's Detroit building, the new GM logo shown on a video screen for the first time here. Mary Barra saying it's a full circle move. And this is our fourth headquarters here, starting with the very first one on Woodward between Fort and Congress. Mayor Mike Duggan saying Dan Gilbert first pitched him on this idea six years ago. And I said, Dan, they haven't been in the Renaissance Center that long. Are they even looking for a new headquarters? He says, no, nah, they don't realize they need one yet. Uh, he says, but I'm going to pitch them. Now, stepping back and looking at this major Detroit business shift is longtime Detroit real estate analyst and retail specialist, Jim Beery. He leased the retail operation inside the Rensen before GM bought it and says it's actually a good thing Bedrock will now do the heavy lifting of repurposing the Rensen. They'll be able to do some things with that building that General Motors wouldn't because General Motors is not, uh, their DNA is not made up to operate a multi-story built, multi multi-disciplined building. And rather than look at the tall hill to climb to give the Rensen relevance again, Bieri sees it as most entrepreneurs do. And this is a kind of a space that could attract something we can't think of. And so maybe there's an opportunity from that perspective. Now that is the optimistic vision for the Rensen. There are a lot of people wondering what in the heck Dan Gilbert is going to be able to do with it. They, they talk about maybe putting some housing in that, but getting uh, plumbing up and down in that building has long been an issue. So it's a problem. And the question of whether they can actually salvage it um, or will it become a largely vacant place that very few people can really make it around and navigate inside, we'll have to see. But Dan Gilbert and his team have taken Taking that job on. And as I talked to Sandy Baru, the head of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the other day, he says, I don't bet against Dan Gilbert. So we'll see what they yeah. do. Yeah. Back to you. Uh, Rod, I know you said GM only has about 12, 2,500 people working in the Rensen building. Mm -hmm. How long do you think it'll take for GM to move those employees from there to the, the new Hudson's mm -hmm. Detroit building? Right. They have not given us specifics yet, but the building isn't finished. So they got to finish it first. Sure. They just topped it off last week. Um, and that's the, for the big tower. For the office building, it's going to take some time. So they're saying probably 2025. We're not sure exactly when just yet. All right. Can't wait to see how it all pans out. Rod, we appreciate it. A local orchard owner's hate-filled rant against a family from Ann Arbor is costing him a lot of money right now. We first brought you this story last fall when video surfaced of Steve Elzinga ranting against Muslims and telling the Mahmoud family they couldn't leave his orchard. Sean Lay joins us live with the new developments, and Sean, that family filed a civil lawsuit. They did, and I want to catch everyone up on this story to refresh your memory. We're talking about Erie Orchard, it's down in Monroe. The owner on camera telling a family they he wouldn't let leave, every Muslim steals from me. Well, the owner, through a lawsuit, has now paid a large settlement to that family. Every Muslim that comes in here steals from you. Every Muslim that comes in here steals from you. That's right.
That is the owner of Erie Orchard in Monroe, Steve Elzinga, launching words of hate against Ann Arbor father Joe Mahmoud, his wife, and his two little girls who simply wanted to have a family day at Elzinga's orchard. But instead of telling the family, thanks for coming, Elzinga detained the family, searched their SUV, accusing them, including Mahmoud's little girls, of being thieves. So are you holding me hostage here? I'm holding you until you pay your bill. The racist rant has cost Erie Orchard customers. A civil suit brought by the family, family attorney Abdullah Mogni says, has cost El Zinga plenty to settle that suit. For too long, it seems like Muslims have, have been berated uh, and, and put down and, and labeled and, and mistreated, and we decided no more. Why file a civil suit? Mogni says the family's daughters were traumatized and have been in therapy since. I know that what had said uh, is wrong. Um, what, what had been said is something that no person should ever have to, to hear about themselves or their religious group. But in the, at the end of the day, I think this business owner learned a lesson, and all business owners can now learn a lesson, that you are not going to be able to put any minority group down. You cannot ethnically intimidate any minority group without consequence. All right, back here live, the owner of Erie Orchard, Steve Elzinga, did post an apology online soon after that incident. We're live tonight. Sean Lake, Local 4. Wow, Sean, thank you. New video released today showing last week's fatal officer involved shooting incident in Warren. The body camera footage shows the moments leading up to the shooting, which unfolded after police responded to a domestic incident near the intersection of Garber Drive and Ryan Road. In the video, you can see an 18 year old man run and chase officers with a gun in his hand. He then points the gun at officers, and that's when those officers open fire. Police say mental health may have played a factor. They said that he had been up for four straight days, unable to sleep, um, going crazy, uh, and assaulting family members. So there's one thing that we're looking at is a mental health crisis may be part of the issue here. After being shot, the 18-year-old was rushed to the hospital but later died. Police say the gun he was holding was his own and was purchased legally. We've learned of a new case involving a man suspected of breaking into homes of people who'd recently passed away. Jerry Ashley of Detroit told investigators he did yard work for the victim a year ago at their home on Raven Road in Bloomfield Township. That homeowner passed away on February 15th of this year, which Ashley learned by searching obituaries. He told police he broke into the home a few days later to steal items to sell for drugs. Officers searched Ashley's home and found stolen items, including a presidential task force coin and a letter addressed to the Bloomfield Township victim. Police believe Ashley broke into dozens of homes across Metro Detroit and far west as, as far west rather as Ann Arbor, using the same method of identifying victims by searching obituaries. Now he remains in custody for home invasions in Gross Point Woods. Dr. Werner Spitz, the medical examiner who worked on high profile cases like the assassinations of President John F. Kennedy and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., has passed away. Now, born to a Jewish family in Germany, Spitz was sent to live in France with an aunt the year Hitler took power. He later got his medical degree from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and came to the U.S. in 1969. Now, over the years, he served as medical examiner in Baltimore, Maryland, Wayne County, and Macomb County. He was in high demand as a trial witness and an advisor in difficult and controversial investigations. Macomb County Executive Mark Hackle calls Spitz an icon who had a special talent for describing complex medical things in a way people could understand. I think his legacy is he's the guy that set the tone, I think, for pathologists to understand, you know, not just about how do you, you know, look at a body and make a determination cause of death. I think it's about, you know, how do you present yourself, you know, not only to a juror, but even publicly, because you're going to get asked questions, you know, from the media and from others uh, as to what you believe may have happened. And you have that independent ability to do so. And he did. So he, like I say, he had a cult of personality, not just with uh, those of us in law enforcement, but I think even the general public knew who he was uh, because of his genuine nature uh, about caring about, you know, these crimes scenes and these individuals uh, that he was uh, that he was looking at to find to find out exactly what happened to them. Yeah. Hackle says Spitz was still working on cases right up until a couple of weeks ago. He was 97 years of age. Well, some teenagers are back home after a world fencing championship thousands of miles away. How about this? The fencing club from Troy went all the way to Saudi Arabia to show off their skills. Victor Williams is live with more on what they accomplished and the warm welcome they got upon returning to Detroit Metro Airport, Victor. <laughs> Oh yeah, Kimberly and Damon. You know, we were right there almost when these guys got off the plane. 
The family members are right there also, and you would have thought that they had just won the Super Bowl. It's the warmest of welcomes for a team coming back from the Middle East. You know, we went all the way to Saudi Arabia. We had some training camps, but we didn't know what to expect. And they came in second, fifth, and fifth. Several 16-year-olds made the trip from Michigan to Saudi Arabia with 20 hours of travel each way. Adeline Scenic placed fifth. Really amazing, and I'm just so thankful I've been able to come this far. I was really nervous at first. I had never been to a World Championships before. So starting off, I was pretty nervous, but I don't know, the energy just continued to grow, and after the first round, I was feeling really confident. Jada's Deserano placed second. It's been a uh, journey trying to qualify, because uh, the U.S. is one of the most competitive countries in the world for fencing, and I've been coming up just short for the past couple of years. And this year I was finally able to uh, go to World Championships and bring home a medal is uh, absolutely amazing. Perhaps the reason why they did so well is because of the guidance they had from coaches Anatoly Scenic and Anne Marsh Scenic, Adeline's parents. This guy has coached them since they were eight years old. The whole time this was our goal and so I think that they did a great job. And I hope our uh, U.S. team you know, leave the count, medal count and we can end up the first. Now, Luau Yang was another young man that went to Saudi Arabia, did pretty well and came back, but they ended up on a later flight, so we weren't able to catch them. Either way, we are very proud of everyone that came back from Saudi Arabia. Victor mm. Williams. Congratulations to them. All right, great story. Thanks, Victor. We can tell the weather's shifting because there are not too many winter coats out there right now. Oh, it was just absolutely gorgeous, but we know uh, change is coming. Let's check in with Kim Adams, see what's coming our way, Kim. Yes, there are a few changes, including some rain for Wednesday and possibly some thunderstorms. But until then, it's beautiful. We've got 65 in Mount Clemens with lots of sunshine, upper 60s downtown. It's in the low 70s in Adrian and Jackson, also out at Michigan State. It's 71 degrees. 13 degrees colder, though, than it was 24 hours ago when we did hit 80 yesterday. 23 degrees colder than it was 24 hours ago in Gross Seal. So even though it's cooler, it's still technically above normal for this time of year. If you have plans to go to the Tigers game tomorrow. First pitch is at 110. It will be mostly sunny and about 60 degrees and will stay in the 60s throughout the game. It'll be dry and really, really nice weather story. So looking nice for tomorrow, but rain chance two chances once in the morning and then thunderstorms in the afternoon and evening on Wednesday and also some gusty winds to talk about coming up.